Um, so we move to our final talk of the first uh, half of our, uh, our event, and I'd like to welcome Chris Chambers. Chris is a professor at Cardiff University, and Chris, as many of you will be aware, is someone who's been trailblazing some of the solutions in, in how we can deal with replication. And indeed, in the work he's going to talk about today is the idea of pre-registration and how that might be a useful tool going forward. So please put your hands together for Chris Chambers. Right, uh, thanks very much. Um, thanks to the BPS and Royal Society for putting on this great event. Um, I, I was just thinking during Dorothy's talk that it's really easy, and we've had this discussion for decades now about what we should be doing um, in research to improve reproducibility and transparency, but there's not as much discussion about why we should do it and what's the benefit for the individual. And I think as Marcus first pointed out, all of this stems from the fundamental rift in the incentive structures in science. On the one hand, we all know, everyone in this room and everyone, everyone who's ever done science knows that what's best for science is high quality research that's made public as, and as, is made as transparent as possible regardless of the outcome. But what's best for you as an individual scientist is to produce a lot of publishable results. And until we man figure out a way to realign this incentive structure so that what is good for you as an individual is also good for the community, the individual always wins. We can stand here for 100 years and say, you should pre-register, you, sh you should share data, you should do this, you should do that. But no one's going to do it unless there's a good reason to do it. And that's been my focus for the last few years, to try and develop um, a, an approach, a procedure, a, a, a philosophy that, that brings these together. Now we know um, that, and there's no, I don't need to rehash this, but we know that if you put researchers under pressure to get publishable results, they will produce them. They may not be true, they may not be reliable, they may not be reproducible, but you will get the, all these positive results. And, and so you end up with this litany of, of failures in the scientific method, publication bias, p-hacking, retrofitting hypothesis, lack of sharing of data, low power and lack of replication. These are now standard features in psychology and in other sciences that is uncontroversial. And they conspire to short circuit our scientific method that we teach. We know that the scientific method doesn't work quite like this. It's not a perfect deductive cycle like this. But this is what we teach. This is what our statistical methods are predicated upon. And we know that these problems conspire to undermine that methodology at every every stage, and we need to work very hard to correct and, and reinforce the model at each of those stages. So why is this happening? Well, it's happening for, I think, a very simple reason, which is that we place far too much importance on the results of experiments and the research projects, and not enough emphasis on the processes that produce them. And that's because we're humans, and this is human nature. Results make science exciting. We wouldn't be doing science if we didn't find results captivating, that's what keeps us coming back, that's why we want answers to questions. But the minute we start judging the quality of science according to the results and deciding what should be seen in the public domain according to results, and the minute we start judging scientists themselves according um, to their results, then we are soft science. We have fallen. And that is the problem that we need to solve. And we can solve it by adopting quite a simple philosophy, that when it comes to hypothesis testing, what gives a piece of scientific research its value is the question that it asks and the quality and robustness and the rigor of the method that it uses and never, ever the result it produces. And this leads you to an interesting, it led me to an interesting conclusion, which is that if you, if you believe this to be true, then in fact we're doing publishing all wrong. We in fact should be making editorial decisions at journals in such a way that the decision maker is blind to those results because the results can only bias you. They're not something that should inform your judgment about whether a piece of science is publishable or not. Now that's all well and good in theory, so how can we make this happen in, in practice? And this is where registered reports comes in. So we set up registered reports three years ago in the journal Cortex, and the idea was to try and incentivize a different, a more radical, different way of thinking about publishing. There are four key features. The first is that researchers decide their hypotheses, their procedures, their main analyses before they embark on data collection. 
part of the peer review process takes place before the experiments are conducted. So that protocol is peer reviewed. Passing that stage of peer review virtually guarantees publication if you follow through with your protocol. And original studies and high value replications are welcomed as part of this initiative. So how does it work in practice? So what will happen is an author will submit what we call a stage one manuscript, which will include an introduction, proposed methodology, analyses, and any pilot data as applicable, for instance, if they want to validate a methodology or a power analysis. This then goes out to peer review after a, an, a triage process, and reviewers are asking the following questions. Are the hypotheses well-founded? Is there a strong rationale for asking this question and making that particular prediction? Are the methods feasible? Is the methodological detail in that protocol sufficient that an independent expert or specialist in that field could replicate that particular result? Is the study well-powered? And we set a threshold of more than 90% at Cortex. Different journals set different degrees of, um, of power that they require. And have the authors included sufficient um, conditions in their experiments that they can confirm that their study will provide a fair test? So what we would con conventionally think of as positive controls, manipulation checks, things that we teach in psychology, in first year psychology, in fact, but which we often miss when we're designing our own research experiments. Now, if the reviews at this stage are positive, then the journal issue, issues what's called an in-principle acceptance, a provisional acceptance regardless of the study outcome, and the protocol at this point is not published. It's held in reserve by the journal. The authors go away and do their research, and then once they've con conducted their study, collected their data, and analyzed their data according to their protocol, then they can resubmit what we call a stage two manuscript, which includes the introduction and method from their first stage one submission, which is virtually unchanged except for changes in tense, obviously between future and past, um, and a results section which is divided into two distinct um, kind of sections. One is the outcome of the registered confirmatory analyses. So these are the, the outcomes of the analyses that you said you would do. And the other part is the, any unregistered exploratory analyses, transparently identified, but of course open to the freedom of the investigator to pursue, where you can report anything that you thought up along the way, and there can be very good reasons for doing exploratory analyses. Um, but the most important thing and the most defining feature of this model is that they are clearly distinguished in a way that is not true for standard uh, research reports. The manuscripts include a discussion, and then as, part, as a standard part of the process, data are deposited in a public archive so that other researchers can uh, use that data, analyze that data, um, perform their own analyses on that data and so on. It can be a useful public resource. This goes out to stage two review where reviewers are now performing a very simple process. Did the authors uh, follow the protocol? Did the positive controls and manipulation checks that were pre-registered as a way of safeguarding the quality of the study, did they, did they succeed as expected? And are the conclusions that the authors propose justified by the data um, that they present? And if that all checks out, then the manuscript is published. None of these things matters. It's really important to emphasize. And this is, I think, really the main selling point of this format. It doesn't matter whether the hypothesis was supported or not, which means there can be no publication bias because the decision to publish or not is never based upon the outcome of the primary hypothesis testing. Therefore, it doesn't matter whether your P is less than 0.05. It doesn't matter whether your results are novel. Potentially one of the most pernicious criteria, I think, that we see in journal policies. And it, equally, it doesn't matter whether your results are considered to have impact. It doesn't matter what reviewers think of your results as being interesting or not, and whether they think they're a substantial advance or not. That, those are irrelevant considerations. Here's just a few examples of um, registered reports that have appeared at Cortex recently. Um, and the paper that appears looks like a standard paper. Because the protocol is held in reserve by the journal until the final stage of peer review, the whole thing is published at the end. And it has a standard introduction method results discussion format. And it looks and feels like, very much like a normal paper, except that you as a reader and as a critical uh, uh, reviewer after the fact can be assured that the hypothesis wasn't changed that the confirmatory analyses are reported and that exploratory analyses are transparently reported. So I just want to anticipate a few questions. We get, we get this, when, when this um, was uh, started, it, it generated an, a lot of discussion and a lot of, um, I've had 
over the years many, many questions about this particular process. And I'm just going to highlight a few of the major frequently asked questions that we get. The first is, is this format suitable for all sciences, and of course, including psychology? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on what you're doing. So it really is applicable in any area where you're engaging in a priori, deductive, hypothesis-driven research, where one or more of these problems that afflict us apply, various forms of bias, post hoc hypothesizing, and so on. This, this format of publication can help um, address those problems in any area. So it doesn't really matter whether it's psychology or biology or even some areas of physics. What's to stop researchers from pre-registering a study that they've already conducted? I love that this comes up so much. It shows how kind of willing we are to entertain the idea of gaming the system in quite extreme ways. Um, that this can't be done with a registered report without committing fraud because um, when authors uh, submit their data files at stage two, they're time stamped, so to prove that the data was collected on a particular date. Um, and authors must, must also certify when they're resubmitting that all data in their primary experiments was collected after and not before provisional acceptance of, of the protocol. So if you were, if you were prepared to therefore um, pre-register pre a study post hoc, you would be l deliberately lying. And I think that's quite rare, and I don't think many of us would consider taking it such an extreme path. And if we were, we wouldn't bother going through a registered report anyway. We would just make up the data and send it to nature. Um, <laughs> in any case, imagine, imagine if you, were just, you weren't prepared to go that far, but you were prepared to um, just you know, have a punt, to run a study, um, get a result, and then send your protocol in and attempt to pre-register it after the fact. Uh, you'd find that that would backfire anyway because reviewers almost always ask you to amend the procedures. And unless you have a time machine, you can't change a procedure you've already conducted. Um, however, all of those things being the case, it's important to emphasise that this format of publication is not a fraud prevention tool. That's not something it was ever designed to be. It's, it's instead um, a mechanism for incentivising what we would all consider to be best practice when we're engaged in hypothesis-driven deductive science. What's to stop registered reports from becoming a dumping ground for inconclusive results? These are actual questions I've had in the past. Um, a fair point, because if you were to imagine um, uh, this format being applied in the current climate, um, you would see a lot of inconclusive results both ways because of the low power that we know about in the psychological literature that we've known about for many, many years. However, for registered reports, the a priori power requirements help overcome this problem, so requiring high power increases the evidential value of both positive and negative findings. And also, um, I think it's important that we start to embrace methods which are in fact older, but have only been adopted more recently, the Bayesian inferential hypothesis testing approaches, which can, unlike frequentist tests, provide positive evidence of absence rather than being limited to concluding absence of evidence. And when you put these two things together, um, you end up with quite a powerful way of ensuring that whatever is published, regardless of the outcome, will provide a, an informative contribution to the literature. Will this limit exploration or stigmatise exploratory research? It's often said um, when people raise the, say the word pre-registration, the, the automatic response you get from people is, oh, what about exploratory science? What about serendipity? This is going to bind, tie my hands. This is going to limit my ability to be a creative genius. Um, this is not the case. In fact, um, with registered reports, there are no restrictions on being creative and doing exploratory analyses and unregistered exploratory analyses. The only thing is that they are transparently reported as such, which helps everyone. It helps us as investigators avoid um, Richard Feynman's famous quote of fooling ourselves, it avoids us fooling each other and it helps improve the reproducibility of the area. We launched this um, in 2013, as I mentioned, in Cortex, and at the time we felt that it would be worth raising the public profile of this, this initiative. So we convinced um, around 80 senior scientists and members of journal editorial boards to sign a letter with us calling for this format to be offered throughout the life sciences and indeed social sciences. And encouragingly, in those three years, we've seen now the format um, approved or launched at 26 journals, the most recent just being a few days ago. And there's something interesting about this, which is that even though most of us who have promoted this format have um, done so from the, um, the platform of psychology, 
it's been picked up in some interesting areas. So um, you can see here um, not just psychology journals, but psychiatry. Um, there's a special issue in eLife on cancer biology. Um, we're seeing um, Journal of Accounting Research. This is fascinating. I didn't even know this was an area of investigation. But there's an area called empirical accounting, which performs hypothesis tests on financial records um, extracted from companies. And they do basically the same thing we do with a completely different sampling approach and a different set of questions. And registered reports is gaining traction there. Um, we're seeing it um, in areas of political science and um, more sort of uh, organizational and media psychology. And one that I want to pick up on is, um, given this where we are standing today, is um, at a journal called Royal Society Open Science, um, where we launched registered reports in uh, November 2015. And the, the nice thing, the unique thing about here is that this journal publishes science across more than 200 different specialisations. And uh, what we've done is we've launched it across all those areas. So do, it doesn't matter whether you're a psychologist or a chemist, physicist, biologist, it doesn't matter. Um, your, this format is now available to you as a researcher. So this is going to be a very interesting litmus test for the traction and the, and the need um, for this format in these different areas. Uh, and if you go to, if you navigate to the RSOS page, you can find more details on that particular format. In addition, um, for those so interested, uh, we've set up an information hub on the Open Science Framework where um, we provide a long list of frequently asked questions about this format. I think there's over 30 now. It tends to grow, but we've, it's sort of plateaued at the moment. We haven't had a new question for some time. But um, it also lists all of the um, journals that are currently offering the format. It links to the author guidelines for those specific journals. Uh, it provides resources for editors. So if there's any journal editors in the room who are interested in adopting this format, it provides a lot of materials, um, for instance, uh, cover letters that you can um, uh, send to reviewers, template uh, decision letters. Um, and it also provides a description of the process and how it applies in different contexts. So if this, um, this web link here is a bit obscure, but if you just Google registered reports, it comes up as the top hit. Now as we look forward and look ahead in the coming months, um, the, we're going to see this format go even further. So um, we're going to see it offered by um, more prominent journals in, over the next 12 months, and we're also going to see a new form of registered reports spring up uh, in partnership between journals and funders where um, the stage one protocol that is submitted to a journal um, is actually very similar to a grant application in many ways. It's a very specific, very precise grant application. So um, it would be very interesting, wouldn't it, to try a format of registered report where the journal and the funder simultaneously review a protocol and the decision to publish is made at the same time and by the same group of people um, as the decision to award funding. And that's something that we're in very positive discussions with, with a number of journals and funders. So that's something that could quite radically change the landscape because it shifts some funding out of the traditional pot where the emphasis is on, on um, novelty, innovation, risk-taking and creativity and moves it into an area where those things aren't completely nullified but issues of transparency, reproducibility and rigour are raised to the same level. So I'll leave it at that. Um, thanks for your time and, and do... Um, come and chat with any of us afterward if you want to hear more about this. Thank you.